education, uh, teach you some things that you may know, uh, maybe some things that you might be refreshed on, um, and then hopefully have some time for questions at the end. Uh, first of all, um, thank you for having me. Um, I've got myself here um, from the financial aid office at University of Virginia, and then my colleague, uh, Andrew Lashwa, uh, who is also here. Uh, we're both financial aid administrators. Um, so we sort of deal with financial aid from the applying and reading and awarding process. Um, so we may end up uh, teaching you some things that, um, that you, you may not have known. Um, and then, like I said at the end, maybe some time for some questions. Sorry, is this okay or a little, uh, a little dark? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't think we can get the light just right. If we turn the lights on even at the dimmest level, yeah, it's not that dim, is it? Oh. Yeah, it's a little harder to see the presentation, but you guys, this way, the other way, this is better? Yeah, sorry. The other way. I don't have handouts, but I did um, send the presentation as a file uh, to Mr. Johnson, and I might be able to coordinate with him uh, to see if he could, uh, you know, distribute it to whoever wants it. Um, it exists as a PowerPoint uh, presentation, so if you've got the program on your computer, you might be able to open it. Uh, might be pretty helpful to have that. It's a good idea. So again, I'm Robert. This is Andrew. Um, I'm an undergraduate financial aid administrator. Take a moment just to review some of the things that we're hoping to cover tonight. First of all, what is financial aid? We want to give you guys some definitions, some basic information on the different kinds of financial aid that you might see um, as you um, embark on the college selection process coming up for a lot of you. Also talk about how to get that aid. What's the application process like? What do you have to do in order to obtain those different kinds of financial aid? I'll walk you through some helpful resources and then, like I said, leave you some time for some, uh, from, for some questions at the end. So what is financial aid? Usually we describe financial aid as really just a set of funds that are provided to students and families to help you pay for your post-secondary or college um, expenses. These can include, well, scholarships and grants. That's what everybody's probably hoping to get. Work study is a really great opportunity for students to work at the school that they attend um, and earn some need-based financial aid assistance that way. And then um, there are also loans, uh, which is, uh, represents money, basically, that, that has to be repaid. Sometimes it's more than what you borrow. Sometimes that involves interest. We'll talk just a little bit about that. Um, usually people have a lot of questions about that. I think this diagram over here um, is, is kind of neat. It gets a little cut off over there on the side, but it sort of shows people a visual representation of how all of these kinds of awards work together. So you can have a financial aid package that includes scholarships and loans. Maybe you've got a friend who was offered a financial aid package that includes scholarships and work study and loans because maybe they go to a different institution. So it sort of shows that a lot of people will receive different awards based on what was provided in the application process. So the type of financial aid that a lot of people have a lot of questions about up front is the scholarship. Um, how do I get scholarships? Um, how do I get the scholarships that the school offers versus the private ones or the um, community scholarships like uh, Elks, Walmart, Coca-Cola, these are all popular scholarships too. But of course the colleges and universities offer their own money as scholarships and they might offer that for different criteria from school to school. I've got a couple of different comparisons up there. Some schools use the application for admission to determine scholarship eligibility. Some schools have a separate application just for the scholarships. If you're interested in those, you'll have to do something additional. Some schools may require you to have a completed application for financial aid. That's the FAFSA. Some of you may have heard of the FAFSA. And then everything else that you have to do for that school, you've got to do it if you want the scholarships. Some might not require so much. So really, the moral of this story is all schools are going to operate a little bit differently according to their own resources and their own needs. So you definitely want to pay close attention to the requirements of each institution that you're looking at just so that you can really maintain awareness of what you need to do and when you need to do it in order to get the best financial aid possible. Grants oftentimes are synonymous with scholarships. Um, sometimes people will use those words, grants and scholarships, interchangeably. And really the reason is because grants and scholarships basically 
They're both money that does not have to be repaid. It's money that's given to the student that you don't have to pay back. It doesn't accrue interest. So a lot of people do think of it as, as free money. Um, in the financial aid world, um, oftentimes you might hear a financial aid professional refer to them in different contexts. A lot of times we think of scholarships as those sort of talent-based or merit-based or academic-based free money awards, whereas the grants are really based upon need, financial need. Um, the application process uh, gives you a chance to provide information to the school, and we can determine what your need is. It has nothing to do with grades, SAT scores, extracurricular activities, that stuff. Financial need is different. So in a lot of cases, people do think of grants and scholarships as different, but then at the same time, they're synonymous because it's all free money. Loans, another source of a lot of different questions. You probably have heard uh, a little bit about loans in the news recently because there have been some uh, pretty important developments uh, in Congress about loans. Lots of different kinds of loans. They can be federal, so offered by the federal government. Um, they can be in the student's name. They can be in the parent's name. Uh, they can come from a banking institution or a private lender. Uh, those are the private or alternative student loans. Again, as you can see from looking at the information up here, the moral of the story is they're all different. And so you want to make sure that you know uh, what your school requires in order to get the best financial aid possible, whether it's scholarships, loans, or work study. Work study is basically, again, an opportunity for the student to work, to earn money to put towards their student account. We define it here as need ba a need-based award that provides an opportunity to work and earn money to help pay for educational expenses. It's basically like student employment. There are lots of regulations surrounding how much the student can work, how much they can earn, what's the, the minimum that a student can earn. Uh, but again, this is a need-based financial aid award. So I gave you an overview, and it was pretty quick, uh, of different kinds of financial aid that you may see or may hope to see in, uh, in the students' financial aid packages that are offered. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about how to get financial aid, what you'll have to do, maybe even when you'll have to do it, I've got a little timeline here to sort of show you the basics. Um, I mentioned a while ago, uh, a couple of minutes ago, that all schools are going to operate a little bit differently in terms of the financial aid process. And so you're definitely going to have to pay attention to the school's website, uh, admissions and financial aid counselors. Um, if you like events like this, maybe you're planning on going to a series of um, college fairs. Um, it's definitely a very popular thing for seniors in high school to do. This is a great way to learn about what you'll need to do to qualify for financial aid. Um, at the very least, you'll have to do step one up there, which is file the FAFSA. Anybody heard of the FAFSA? Maybe if you have older siblings, you might have, uh, might have had to do that. It's basically the, the main application for qualifying for financial aid. Anybody know what FAFSA stands for? Free application for federal student aid. I stress that because it's free. Um, there are some services out there that will charge you a fee uh, to complete the FAFSA for you, and that's fine. It's a business, and that's what they want to do. Um, but the FAFSA is free, and so if you access it from the Department of Education's website, most people do complete it online, there's no charge for it. Um, on the other hand, step two, if your school requires it, you'll need to complete the CSS profile. It's a different application that you might want to become a little bit familiar with. Not all schools require it. It is a paid application, you do have to pay for it. Um, and again, it's administered by the College Board. And that should actually be available for next year in just a couple of weeks here. So now is a really good time to start thinking about the financial aid process, as I know that you are, because you're here. If you're required by the school, you will also have to complete uh, an institutional financial aid application. We've got the free application for federal student aid, but institutions might have their own questions for you to determine how they're going to be stewards of their own funds. How are they going to distribute their own awards to students? And maybe they don't, um, maybe they have more uh, 
uh, strict criteria than the federal regulations. And if you're required to, you'll want to get those, keep those uh, tax documents handy in the spring. W-2s, tax, federal tax returns, those sorts of things, because the school might ask for them to perform, uh, to perform verification of the information that was provided in the FAFSA, the CSS profile, whatever else they have. They're going to want to verify that information a lot of the time. Here's a screenshot from that FAFSA website. Note that it's FAFSA.gov. Um, there's a FAFSA.com. There are lots of different references to the FAFSA online. Uh, but again, the free application for federal student aid is at FAFSA.gov. This is what it looks like now. The FAFSA should be available, as you saw a moment ago, uh, January 1st. Uh, so just a couple months. Uh, we'll see what the new website looks like. It might look exactly like this, but it might look a little different. Here's a screenshot from the current view of the CSS profile. Again, this is College Board, collegeboard.org, also collegeboard.com, I think it redirects you. And then there might be some other requirements, uh, but the second, uh, second bullet point up there, know your school's requirements and deadlines is very, very important. Again, those websites, college counselors, uh, events like the one you're at tonight, college fairs, they're really, really good resources for you to learn and become very familiar with the application requirements and deadlines. You definitely don't want to miss a requirement. You certainly don't want to miss a deadline because you could be missing out on a lot of money if you do that. Just a brief mention of a process called federal verification. It's real. Uh, Andrew and I know a lot about federal verification because uh, the school has to perform it using uh, tax documentation. Um, some FAFSA uh, applications will be selected by the U.S. Department of Education for verification. Uh, it's not a punishment, it just means that the school is probably going to have to collect additional information from you to verify the information that was supplied on the FAFSA. So again, keep those tax documents handy. Or uh, another thing you can do is step two down here. Use the IRS data retrieval tool. This is an excellent, excellent thing to do when you're filing a FAFSA. When you get into the application, it will ask you, have you filed your taxes yet? And if you have, you may be able to pull your data from the IRS's website directly into your FAFSA application. They're both government websites, so it's my belief that they're probably pretty secure. What happens is you leave the FAFSA and you go to the IRS website, you retrieve your data, and you pull it right back into the FAFSA, and it automatically populates your tax document or your tax information into the right places on the form. A lot of people are often daunted by the complexity of the FAFSA, and this is one way to really simplify it. And if your file is selected for verification, the Department of Education currently says that if you do that, that may reduce the amount of paperwork that you have to provide to the college or university. So it's a good idea to save time while you're doing the application, but then also throughout the entire application process. The school may require a little bit less from you if they know that you've done the IRS data retrieval tool. So keep that in mind. So, a couple of words here about what Andrew and I do um, from day to day. A lot of people want to know what we do with the information. Um, you're providing tax documentation, personal information, sensitive information. What do we do with that information? How do we determine what the student's financial need is with all of that? Well, basically what you're doing when you're filing a FAFSA is you're giving the system information to calculate your expected family contribution, or EFC. Very, very common acronym. Uh, if you haven't heard it yet, you probably will a lot over the next several months because it's what schools use to determine what you're eligible for. So we use the expected family contribution to determine eligibility for need-based financial aid and to prepare uh, an award package. Uh, as Andrew and I know, the formula for figuring out what the EFC is, is is extremely complicated. I'd say complex. There's a lot of information that goes into it. Um, there are a lot of allowances that are provided to the family to sort of protect and shelter 
um, some of the information that was reported. So those are some good things, but it's very, very complex. The result is basically a figure that the school uses to subtract from what it costs to go there, and that's how they determine what you need. They look at the overall cost of the program that the student is going to enter into, and then they subtract out the expected family contribution, and that figure is the demonstrated financial need, which is what we use to calculate what you're going to be eligible for. Talk about some helpful resources here. We talked about the FAFSA, remember FAFSA.gov. The Department of Education, anything like that, .ed.gov, at the end of it is going to be really helpful um, in terms of figuring out the, the Department of Ed's requirements. College Board, again, is the administrator of the CSS profile. And the net price calculator. Um, because of a federal regulation, all schools are actually required to have a net price calculator um, as of a couple of years ago. And what this is, is a tool to help the family predict what you might qualify for at each individual school. So another good reason to look at the uh, school's websites is not only to familiarize yourself with the application requirements and deadlines, but also to seek out the net price calculator. This is basically the device where you put in some information to sort of simulate what you might qualify for if you were to attend that school. The financial aid application process is very, very long. Um, oftentimes, um, and so you may need just a little heads up somewhere within that time frame of what you might qualify for. You've got some decisions to make, right, in the spring. So you may need to know, or you may just want to know what you might qualify for in a particular school. So it's going to sort of simulate what your package might look like if you were to uh, attend there. This is a screenshot of our net price calculator, actually. Uh, we've got our cost of attendance. Remember that formula I had a moment ago? Cost of attendance. And then what happens is it shows you there in the middle of the page what this hypothetical family that I made up would qualify for in grant aid. And then their estimated net price was basically the cost of attendance minus that grant aid. There are other forms of financial aid, though, that might help them meet that price. And one of them is a student loan. You can see that down there at the bottom. Student loan in the amount of 7000 So if the student chooses to accept that loan, you can subtract that from the net price. So what you're left with down there is the estimated remaining cost. Finally, some other resources to help you manage the cost of education. If um, you do get your financial aid award. Um, maybe there's some outside scholarships thrown in there. But you want something else to sort of help you, like I said, manage the cost. The Virginia Prepaid Education Program, VPEP, very, very popular. Uh, the Virginia Education Savings Trust, or VEST, is a, another 529 plan like VPEP that you can set up, or maybe you have been setting up, uh, to help you manage educational costs. We're all most likely from Virginia here, um, but there are other very popular ones, Florida Prepaid, Texas, um, a lot of states have their own plans. And then schools might also have their own payment plans. We definitely do. We have a couple of different options. If your financial aid is in place, you get your bill, aid isn't quite enough to cover the charges, and maybe you want to split up the remaining cost into more manageable payments, uh, the school can most likely work with you to, uh, to accommodate. So you can sort of see, when you look at this figure now, there's the, the, the whole concept of paying for college, and then the different things that come into play to help you, uh, to help you accomplish that. Uh, obviously, work-study loans, scholarships and grants, and then, of course, the family's contribution. Maybe it's from a payment plan, maybe it's a personal payment. Well, these are all resources that are available to the student to help you manage the cost. A couple of useful tips here, we'll just remind you of one at a time. Again, uh, probably said it about a dozen times tonight, pay very, very close attention to college and university application deadlines. Use the IRS data retrieval tool, um, just because it's a, great, it's a really great way to simplify the application process when you're filling out the FAFSA and you say, I don't know what this question is asking. Um, why don't you just go to the IRS's website and pull your data in right to where it needs to go? Um, but also, it might simplify the application process if you're selected for federal verification. 
because the DOE, the Department of Education, says that if you do that, the school might not have to ask for as much documentation from you. Take advantage of each school's net price calculator. They're really good predicting tools to help you figure out what you might qualify for if you go there during a given year. And continue to look at, look for, and apply for scholarships. These local organizations, um, oftentimes churches, local businesses, uh, larger national organizations, like I said, Walmart, Coca-Cola, a lot of these have scholarships, and you might be one of the few people who's applying for them. Um, so it's definitely a good thing to look into. High school guidance counselors are great resources for doing this. So we've reached the point um, where I've given you a lot of information in a fairly short amount of time. Some of you may have heard it before. Some of you might have been, might have been completely new. Um, are there any questions for either myself or Andrew? Things that you've been wondering about? Question of that. How early should we apply for scholarships? I mean, my, my daughter's in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. Should we start now, or should we that's a good question. She asked how early they should apply for scholarships. I assume you mean those outside scholarships, those private uh, organizations. Um, that's a good question, and I would say it probably varies from organization to organization. Some of them, I think probably the majority of them, and you guys can chime in too if you, from your own experience, they might require the student to be a senior or to be going into college the next year. I'm not sure how often they sort of hold on to funds. I think that in our office, the majority of outside students, we, we have a very talented student body who um, brings in a lot of uh, tons and tons of uh, outside scholarships through our offices, our, our office, and we have processed them. But I think the majority of those are probably for high school seniors, people that are going right into college. Uh, I don't know the frequency of how often they will allow you to say, get the scholarship while you're a junior, and, and put it aside until you get to college. Uh, but you may, if you go out there and you search for scholarship opportunities for juniors, 10th graders, uh, you might find some that, that are willing to do that. Good question. Question? What does it mean to be a new fly? Um, uh, to be honest, I, that's probably a question for an admissions department. Um, I, I, I don't know a whole lot about the concept of me blind, being me blind, uh, but it definitely has something to do uh, with the admission process, who the students are going to, uh, to let in. Any other questions? Question back. What's, um, what's UBA's, uh, percentage of need met now? Uh, we meet 100% of demonstrated financial need. I thought that changed. Your policy changed now. Uh, it didn't change from 100% of financial need. Um, from year to year, we may need it differently for different students, but we're definitely committed to meeting 100% of demonstrated <coughs> financial need. You may be referring to um, the, the Board of Visitors' decision to use loans in financial aid packages of low-income students for the first time. Uh, we have a, an Access UVA program. Uh, for a while, we were not using loans to meet financial need of a certain population of students, um, and the Board of Visitors just approved a decision to, uh, to, to to allow us to do that, to use loans. So it's not, um, um, you're not giving 100% free money, how much are you requiring? Uh, it, it's going to vary from student to student, uh, but there is a cap on the amount of loans um, that students can borrow. Um, there are actually lots of different caps on loans that students can borrow that vary from year to year. You may have seen a slide in the presentation that showed first year students are eligible for uh, $5,500 in, um, in uh, direct loans. Second years are eligible for 6,500. Third and fourth and beyond those students, they're eligible for $7,500. So there are already maximums sort of built into the federal regulations that say how much loans we're supposed to give, uh, that we're allowed to give students. Well, if someone has zero EFC, mm -hmm. how much do they have to pay? Uh, it's, I can't say how much they're going to have to pay. 
Um, but I can say that somebody with a zero federal EFC will at least qualify for um, the full Pell Grant. And if they meet certain criteria and are considered a low income student, um, they may see uh, a lot more grants than that. It's pretty hard to predict. Did you have one to What's that? It's on your calculator now? The net price calculator? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you were to put some information in there and see what your EFC was, if it was a zero EFC, um, in addition to, like, the Pell Grant, it might show additional grants above that. Well, my, my point was that you used to pay 100% in free money, and then you just changed the policy. I just wondered what the policy is now. The, the, the change in policy was basically that for the lowest income population that we have, where we used to offer full grant packages to students, yeah. right now they do qualify for some loans. You don't know what the number is? Um, it's probably going to be, uh, for in-state students, probably about $3,500 a year. Okay, that's all I've got. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes, we award Pell and the uh, federal loans too as part of the financial aid package. Oh no, yeah, no, those are not those are, are not third party, those are not like private uh, resources. Yes, that the Pell Grant and the student loans were awarded through our office and they are the direct loans. I was going to add, when you fill out the FAFSA, you put which schools you want to receive the FAFSA. You put which schools you want to receive it, and when you submit it online, it goes to those schools. So if you put University of Virginia as one of the 10 schools you want to apply to, that would be sent to us, to our office, to prepare it. Here's our contact information. If you have any questions for UVA, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, we're open standard hours, basically Monday through Friday. Um, on Tuesdays, we open at 10. Um, but we take phone calls. If you have questions, you're welcome to send us an email as well. Uh, we'll be happy to try to answer them. Good luck.